Hi, everybody. I'm Raina from Garden District Bookshop, and I want to thank you all for showing up tonight for our event with Laura Cayouette and Henry Griffin. We are all here for No Small Parts, which I'm sure you all you all know all about, which is which is why you're here. But um, Laura is also a big uh, film actress, producer, director. Um, she has been in plenty of films, tons of films that I didn't even know about. I always like feel like I turn on the TV and notice Laura there, but she's been in Django Unchained, Kill Bill. She was on True Detective and Friends. Um, she's also written six fiction novels with which you should all read as well, including the um, Charlotte Reed mystery series, which is amazing and set right here in New Orleans. Um, tonight, she will be talking with Henry Griffin, who is a producer of film writing and directing at UNO here in New Orleans. And they'll be talking about Laura's new book. Well, not new book, the new edition of her book, No Small Parts. And I am excited to be a part of this. So I'm gonna unpin myself here and take it away. Yay, hi everybody. Uh, so again, my name is Henry Griffin. I'm a professor at UNO. I teach screenwriting and directing and I'm also a filmmaker myself. And I'm also an actor um, that's sort of lower on my list as far as my resume goes. But if Laura Cayouette is like a Kevin Bacon person where every <laughs> actor can identify how far or they are away from her, I have a Cayouette number of one. Because <laughs> both did Tremé. Yeah, we were both on Treme. We both played recurring roles on Treme. And uh, the odds of two people in a two-person conversation at a bookstore being redheads is very rare. And Reina, you make it sort of a three, so three redheads. <laughs> yeah. we, um, we be prepared for uh, treachery. So um, <clears throat> my one question for everybody who is participating just by attending is we're all here because we're interested in Laura and we'd love her and perhaps her new book or her new edition of her book. So I'm kind of curious how many of your actors uh, who are really the people who get the most out of this book and uh, also how many of you are familiar with the first edition of the book? Because I like to talk about actors and their career choices, which I think Laura's book is a great primer to. And then also about what's new about the book and why it's important that there's a new edition of the book. So feel free to drop um, your an answer to that question, are you an actor? Have you read the book already and you're interested in the new one? You can put that in the chat and I'll see it. And then also, if you have any questions about uh, the book or that you want to ask Laura, if you put them in the chat, I'll ask them. And if at the end of our conversation, it feels like that question didn't get asked, maybe we'll sort of find a way to informally answer it. But the best way to get a question of yours addressed is to put it in the chat. So that's all. Hi, Laura. How are you? It's good to see you. I, there's so much in your book. It's got so many topics in it. And one of them is how to um, look good in front of a camera when you're shooting yourself. Uh, the moment I started teaching on Zoom, I shared to everybody I know, uh, Tom Ford's notes on how to, how to frame and light yourself for a Zoom session. So um, you look fantastic. How am I doing? I raised my laptop so it could be eye level. So I'm not too chinny. Um, I didn't really get a chance to choose my backdrop and I have a hot light here. Should I have gotten some sort of fill light? How am I doing? <laughs> I, you know, a lot of people like the ring light. That's the most popular thing. I actually don't have my setup right now. I'm just uh, winging it here. You're an author tonight. You're not a star. Yes, yes. not doing, not doing a self-taping look. The rear light. So um, your book covers everything. It covers your fantastic career which is someone who didn't start off wanting, intending to become an actor and realizing it was your real dream. And then fulfilling that dream, starting later than a lot of other people, uh, putting in your time, paying your dues, and then some, and then having a series of breakthroughs that has led to a lovely career as, um, really I would call your career that of a character actor, but which means that you play many small parts supporting. It gives you a lot of variety in what you get to do. And you've made a career for yourself even surviving the move to New Orleans, which is not the front lines of the entertainment industry. Your book addresses so many stages in the career of a working actor that I sort of want to take a little bit of time and talk about your unique perspective on three areas of it. And the first one is breaking in and getting a job and auditioning and just how to get, how to, um, how to do what you would say is booking a job and Richard Dreyfuss would say is a booking a job. <laughs> how to get the gig, how do you get in? And then the second part I'd like to talk about how you do your job 
uh, in a world that it doesn't revolve around the day player or the character actor. And then also, I, I think the other great thing about your career is career maintenance and how much you've done to um, keep people in the Laura Caillou at business, which you are. And so I feel like if we can cover those parts, then I think we've got your most original perspectives in a book that I think is a strong addition to the bookshelf of any actor. There's a lot of books about the act, the craft of acting for the stage, even for the screen. There's a lot of memoirs by actors, but yours is really the book that you wish somebody had given you. Um, what, here I'll ask you a nice, here, here's a question you can answer any way you want. If you were starting your career now, what would you do? If you were in New Orleans, interested in acting, about the age you were when you started, so like not 15, and you wanted to get into screen acting, what would you do now in this reality that we're in? I have not really thought about that. So that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's a difficult time to start. I think it's a very difficult time to start because of you know all the COVID uh, parameters that have been put on travel, shooting out of town, all that stuff. That said, at the same time, I would imagine that it's easier to do some things. I know that, um, for example, I I am now more available nationally as a coach because I am on Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, you know, whatever, to be available as a coach and a teacher. And I know I'm not the only one doing that. The reason that I'm doing it is because I saw other people doing it. It, it spurred me doing it. So. Um, I know that it's much easier to get an education from your living room than it was when I started out. You know, I moved to New York City and went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And then I moved to LA and went to school there. And, you know, I, I studied a lot. That said, um, you can't do a lot of the interactive study, like scene study and things like that. But you can work with people now globally. I mean, I've, I've worked with people in London, I've worked, you know, and it's, that's easier to do now. Um, so I think there, there are things that are easier now in this time of living a more isolated uh, existence. And then there are things that are more difficult. I do know also that casting has, uh, in the beginning of COVID, reached out far and wide to meet people they'd never met before, which was a kind of a fun, unusual thing that happened at the beginning of COVID. Um, so I do know that at this point you can submit to people that maybe before weren't looking at new people. All right, good. That's a good way to start. I did ask you kind of a hard one. Uh, you, I mean, let's pretend that the COVID reality, let's say it's right after the vaccine and there's no longer, <laughs> right? Yeah. I know that no, here again. Here again. <laughs> And there's going to be a great flurry of activity and they're going to be short of movies because nobody was making them. You say in your book, I think you should probably move to Los Angeles, but don't do it too early. Do you think people should wait for their shot? And that is sage advice still today. That That is the one thing I really wish people understood. Um, this is, there's so many things that the that acting involves and engages in the human soul. You know, there's so many parts of us that get engaged as actors, but really at the end of the day, it's about money. And I think if you go to LA before you have proven that you can make money, you have gone too soon. It's extremely expensive to live there. It's extremely difficult to find representation there. Um, and so you, you would do well for yourself to have a reel and a resume that prove I can make money in this industry. That's a good point. You know, my friend Alex McMurray, you know, has a song, you know how they say about New York, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. He says about New Orleans, if you can't make it here, don't leave. <laughs> In other words, New Orleans, there's a lot of filmmaking going on. There's a lot of day playing. There's a lot of shows. When it comes back, it'll be happening right here. And this is a great opportunity to find out if you can get jobs in this environment, maybe you're ready for the big time. Yeah. Um, let me ask you the most central question to auditioning. There's a lot of things everybody can find out in their own way how to get an agent or how to get auditions or how to get in the room. And I think you have such great um, firsthand and super inside information on how to behave in the room. I love the part where you said, 
if somebody if somebody in audition asks you what you did over the weekend, don't say anything about your acting career. <laughs> Talk about something that happened in your anything life. Anything else. Right. So the, the thing, that, the, the biggest challenge I think to nailing an audition is this thing that you talked about in a variety of different ways, which is no matter how small the part is, that you work in performance, but also in auditions at finding a unique take. How do you know if an idea that you have on how to play a character, how to deliver dialogue, or how to use mannerisms in your audition, how can you tell if it's unique? Well, um, another excellent question. Uh, I think if it's the first thing you thought of, then you can probably guess that it's the first thing most people thought of. So um, I think that's the, the first clue that it's not unique is that it's the first thing you thought of. So it came easily from the script means that it was in the script. Um, I, I think the way to, for me, some of the things that I do to find a more unique take, I ask a billion questions and many of them are in that book, uh, you know, that I ask a million questions about the part. But I think also what can really help set you up for success in that is to think about your moment before, think about your relationship to the person that you're having your scene with and think about your moment after. So instead of coming into the scene and doing the scene just as written and then the scene ends, think about what your character was doing right before the scene and what was their relationship to the person they're about to speak to before the scene started. And then how is that scene affecting that? And then where are you going after the scene is over? Because the odds of you coming up with the exact same moment before and moment after as somebody else are much smaller than you coming up with the same stuff from the script. So for example, if the, you know, the example I use in my book is your martini, sir, is the line. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're, if you uh, have just found out that you've had a death in your family, that's a different moment before than if you've just been uh, promoted. And this is the last time you'll ever have to ask your martini, sir, ever again. Uh, you know, those are two very different moment befores. Um, th that to me is where you can really easily find an approach that is unique to you. One of my favorite lines from your book is, um, or pieces of advice is, um, make it so they can't sleep. <laughs> Could you tell me what that line means? Well, first of all, I'm going to credit it to Richard Dreyfus because he is the place I heard that. So. Uh, yeah, I was getting ready for an audition and, and it was, you know, it was my first big break. It was the sequel to Terms of Endearment and, and Richard said to me, make it so they can't sleep, make it so they can't sleep at night thinking of ways to put you in their movie. And I worked very hard on that audition and I thought for sure I had booked it <laughs> and, and I did not. And, uh, I, I was kind of thrown by that because I was really sure that I had that part. Well, I wasn't crazy. It, they started filming the movie and um, I got a call saying that the director couldn't sleep at night because he wanted me in the movie. So he wrote a part for me and flew me in to come and do this other part. And so that was the first time that happened. That was not the last time that happened. Uh, I, I try to leave a taste in the mouth so that, you know, they, they want to work with me again. And they, and if they don't get it on this thing, then maybe they'll call me on, on another thing, or maybe they'll figure out a way to Jimmy me in or whatever, but I try and be unforgettable. And it's true. A lot of your ideas are about how to take a small part and make it a big part and how to get noticed, not just as an actor among auditioning actors, but also if you get a small part in a movie, how to get you to notice it. Um, Whereas, you know, as it from the director's perspective or the editor's perspective, sometimes you don't want small characters to steal scenes. Do you feel right. like there's a way that you can go too far to let people know that you're not? Can, is, is there a risk of overplaying it? Sure, but here's the thing, is that's when the director is allowed to direct you, um, for one right. thing, whether it's the casting director or whether you're on set being directed. <clears throat> I find that's more problematic in a comedy than a drama. Uh, comedic actors tend to want the laughs to be for their mm -hmm. character. Um, so I think there's a 
you know, you if you have been hired to say a straight line, if your martini, sir, is the setup for a joke, then be the setup. Know who you are in the scene. And I talk about that in the book as well. Know which thing you are. Know, understand how the scene is working and how you fit into that. Um, if you're the star of the scene, then obviously swing for the fences. But if you are supporting, then support. You know, if you're the straight guy, set up the joke. Uh, but if if it's not clear, or if it's a dramedy or a drama or one of those things where they say act real, <laughs> whatever the heck that means, um, if it's if it's that kind of thing, then absolutely, I think you have every right to come up with every idea you can come up with and and see which one is going to be the most effective. And if if the director feels like you've gone too far. It's way easier for some, for a director or casting director to say, can you pull it back a little than for them to say, good golly, there's nothing here. Can you fill it in? You know, if you hand somebody a bowl of water and say, this is, this is soup, no. But if you hand somebody a bowl of, of overly filled goulash stew stuff and they just have to take a potato or two out to make it soup, then all is well. Let them choose. Yeah. So, uh, your book is jam packed full of very contemporary advice on how to prepare for an audition, how to enter the room, how to behave in the room, how to slay, leave your head shot, leave them thinking about you. But of course, the new thing is to put yourself on tape, yeah. which is this new reality where there's no room for you to enter, where there's all these advantages that you line up in the book about how you can control the performance that you submit and you can try it a number of different ways that you really have a lot of control over your audition. What's missing, maybe a reader as professional as the one they give you. My question is, as a teacher of directing, I always tell my students when they audition an actor, they figure out whether an actor is any good by how they take an adjustment, where you practice, you, they do it the way they came in prepared and then you give them a suggestion of another way. It's and my I always thing. Say, it's my thing. I think if not do, having that. Yeah, if you can't have, if an actor can't do it more than one way, that's trouble. So how do you handle not having adjustments in the taping process? It's rough because I'm a director's actor. So I, I mean, I, I think that's one reason that my career has been made up of, of so many uh, great directors is because, you know, I'm a, I'm a fun toy to play with. I, I can take direction easily, quickly and well and go wherever you want me to go. And, and I'm not argumentative. I, I will try anything once, twice, if I think it's working, you know, so I'm, I flourish in an environment where you receive uh, direction. And that said, there are many, many actors, maybe even more actors, like maybe a majority who actually prefer having no stress of having a casting director in the room or um, having that audition pressure, uh, competing directly head to head in a waiting room, you know, all that kind of thing. For a lot of people, that's very nerve wracking and they enjoy being able to do 27 takes or, you know, whatever it is that, that is the advantage of being self taping. So, um, there, you know, for some people, their cup overfloweth with bounty that this is, oh, yay, I get to self tape. For people like me who are good in a room, um, I asked many casting directors about this. I said, you know, how do I substitute my being good in a room thing? And they said, you know, really, it's just, that's just not a thing anymore. It's just not the part of it. it you can put it in your uh, slate to give a little sense of your personality. Um, but a, a lot of casting directors don't include the slate when they send the tape. So, so even if you do something on the slate that makes it a little personalized, it's very possible that that will not be included in your audition. Um, I really meant to wear a purple shirt tonight. <laughs> Laura, what is your problem with purple shirts? Um, I just don't think that it's wise to try and please all people. So if, if they're looking for red shirts on the day you're wearing a blue shirt, or they're looking for blue shirts on the day you're wearing a red shirt, they're not gonna hire you, but guess what? They're mostly not gonna hire you anyway. That's the business. Almost all the time, they're not gonna hire you. But they're certainly never looking for purple shirts. They're never looking for people who think that you 
I wore a red shirt, but I think you wanted a blue shirt. So I'm going to try and make you think this is a purple shirt and I'm going to try and please you. And they're never looking for that actor. They are never looking for the actor who has no idea on their own what the character is and no take on the character. So that whole purple shirt chapter, chapter et, is, uh, is about, you know, just have a take and dare to be wrong. It's way, way stronger and will make you much more unforgettable and much more hireable for you to, to make a big, bold, wrong choice, you know, a red shirt when they're wearing blue shirts choice, than to try to second guess what it was they were looking for and try to please them all by muddying up your performance with a whole bunch of, well, maybe they want it this way, maybe they want it that way, I'll do it a little bit this way and a little bit that, no, no. Just do do something and do it horribly, but but do do something <laughs> that is your unique take. You know, be bold enough to fail loudly. How do you, um, when you get the part, we're getting into this part now, you're actually acting on the set, you got hired on a piece and you're playing, let's say that waiter, where you give the example of how to do the, you know, you know, the uh, a part that's really there, an underwritten part about a character who may not even have a name, or a background or you know an intention. Uh, tell me about the process of making a character when the script doesn't really supply you with one so that you can just do the part that they want in a more believable way. Well, it, it depends on how much material they give you. If, if all it says is waiter and it doesn't matter what sex you are and it doesn't say what age you are and it doesn't say anything else about you other than waiter, then you get to fill in as much of that as you care to using the script. Anything that the rest of the script supports, you're allowed to you're allowed to use your imagination as wildly as possible as long as it doesn't disagree with what's in the script. Now say you're only given sides and you have no idea what's in the script and you have nothing but waiter, your martini sir. Um, if you have that then then odds are they called you because they like you. So do a version of you as a waiter. That's a great answer. I, um, one of the things about your book that I really like is I'm always trying to give my students ways to address result direction where they don't know anything better than to tell an actor the effect they want them to achieve. Like be really nervous or be really angry, things that people don't choose to do on purpose. And I try to give them playable verbs and the way that your book addresses this is you call them makeups make where you think as an actor in a scene you can get you can create you can create a strong performance even if you're not being directed by anybody just by taking the scene and making it about you getting something from somebody or trying to force somebody from something my question is pretty intense which is that i noticed there's a part of the book where you say that if you're trying to motivate you know so giving somebody an engagement ring, you can say, I want to give her a good present, but a stronger choice is I want her to marry me. When you give a homeless person a dollar, your objective might be to help them, but you could also be to relieve my guilt or feel better about myself or appear generous. Why are, um, why are selfish motives stronger takes? Because they're real. It's how the human brain operates. <laughs> so so you as a, even as a character think, I should be behaving out of self-interest. Uh, all humans behave out of self-interest is how we stay alive. It, it is a hard drive feature. So it's not, it's not uh, bad parenting or, you know, it's not that you're a selfish person. It's that you're a human. Humans are going to do what they need to do to get what they want when they need it. And uh, so if you're saying you're martini, sir, <laughs> and you need to serve a need through that, that is, that is true. You are only going to give that person a martini if it serves a need for you. Even though your job is to give them a martini, you're only going to do your job if it serves you. So the, the thing with the homeless people, I know it sort of throws people a little bit because people are like, no, but it really does feel good when I give them. Yes, it feels good. That's why you did it. It felt good. That's why you did it. It doesn't change the economic outlook of the homeless person to give them a dollar, but it feels good. It feels a dollar's worth of good, maybe even more. So, you know, that is why you do it. Yes, also to help them, sure, sure. But that's not a very strong choice as an actor. And, and you can tell the difference, even in a self-tape, you can tell the difference between a person who chose one of those more altruistic, uh, you know, where you actually have to think more about 
well, why does it make you feel good? And, but you know, whereas if you just say I did it so that I could be a, feel like I'm a better person, that's, that's probably more realistic about what the exchange was. All right, good. You and Socrates are on the same page. Um, <laughs> let me, um, uh, my last question uh, before I've sort of moved to career maintenance is what does it mean to keep your knees bent? Be ready for anything at all times, be ready for anything. And if you live in LA, you have to be ready for anything at all times, meaning in your house, out of your house. What it, like if you leave your home in LA, you are auditioning. I, I love it. There's a whole section on how to sort of be supple and flexible. And so much of the book is like really, you know, it's funny. I was a screenwriter first and I pitched a lot in the nineties and nobody ever told me how long to be in the room, how long a pitch should be. Nobody ever said like, they're gonna ask if you wanna order lunch. Don't <laughs> get a glass of water, right? All these things, your book is absolutely full of them. And you, the section of your book that's about career maintenance, which is really what you do after you've, you know, you've been in a couple of iconic films and you've had a couple of good parts and you've had strong appearances and movies that have some sort of cult followings. Um, I totally didn't know the audition for Wave the Gun. Yes, I did. One Does of my it, very best auditions ever. I didn't get the part, but it was one of my best auditions ever. And it's the one movie I'm in that people know. So I'm, <laughs> it's the one that just fell right into my lap. So, um, but um, you, you talk about sort of getting over any issues you have relating to sort of having a direct relationship with your fans, uh, including going to sign your advice on how to like do that part of your career is so specific. You tell us when you go to the convention to sell signed photographs, how to break down the $200 in cash that you need to make change. That's how specific your book is. It really tells you so much. It's an enormous toolkit, your book, and I'm really grateful for it. But tell me, let's say um, somebody has been in some films or they've, you know, they've been on a TV show that people watch or they were they had one line in a big movie or, you know what I mean? Or they're like you that they've been noticed because they were on that episode of Friends or what have you. How do you, how do you go about building a sort of brand for yourself? Well, I started working before the term brand meant anything other than, you know, products. Uh, that, that term wasn't applied to humans when I was starting out. Um, so I am of an older school of the, yeah, I mean, and I guess I'm sort of not even in agreement with it because I look at somebody like Sean Penn. What is his brand? Excellence, right? Isn't that the brand? But, but when would we have figured that out? Because first he was Spicoli. What does Spicoli have to do with what becomes Sean Penn's career? And, and Matthew McConaughey was first, you know, all right, all right, all right. You know, like there's so many actors who, I mean, if it, okay, then if the brand is excellence, then that's what everybody should be shooting for. Because I, I feel like it's dangerous to, to look at your brand as I've made this choice of this is how I'm selling myself and this is all there is to sell. Um, especially because you're not actually in charge of how the world sees you. Uh, you can affect how the world sees you. Um, you know, Britney Spears was a delightful young girl in a uh, sexy little schoolgirl outfit. And then one day she shaved her head and got out of the car with her legs open and she rebranded herself as a crazy yep. person. But, you know, I personally feel like go for a brand of excellence like Sean Penn where they can't put a finger on you. And it's not about that, oh, they always deliver in this and you shouldn't hire them for that. Or, you know, well, I, I feel like it's something to leave open and they're gonna tell you what your brand is sometimes. Let me take it back to the career maintenance thing because it's something for you to do while you're waiting for this, this the next part, you know, after the pandemic's over, you might get back to engagement with fans who wanna meet you and see what you're doing. Has a, your experience of like, you know, hanging a backdrop and selling photographs and meeting people who love your work and taking selfies. Has it led to work opportunities for you? Uh, actually it has, and, and not all of them come to fruition. That is one thing about dealing directly with the public is that, you know, people want to be able to communicate with you maybe again after the event. 
uh, if you're at a signing convention or if you're at a premiere or whatever, you know, sometimes people want to be able to get a hold of you later. And so they'll talk about a project that they would like to involve you in. Uh, and and sometimes that's a real thing. And sometimes that's a theoretical thing. And, and sometimes it's a, if everything lines up right, it'll happen in 10 years thing. Right. Um, yeah, and you won't even be right for the role anymore. So, um, you know, it's, I'm cautious about uh, connecting with fans until I understand whether the, if they're trying to get in touch with me again, uh, whether that's something that I want to be a part of. I understand that they're telling me they would like to be a part of being in touch with me in the future. But I, I, I do, I do this even with regular just relationships. I allow room for people to show up for me at least one time doing at least one thing before I will do anything for them. So uh, for example, if, if I meet a person at a party or whatever, and they say, um, you know, they really want to do this, that, or the other thing with me, I will say, well, why don't you call me tomorrow after two and we'll talk about it. If they don't call me the next day after two, I'm out. Well, you just led me to my favorite line in your book, which is that the way that you do anything is the way that you do everything. That's really, as somebody told you that, it's a very wise thing. So if somebody is late for the audition, they're gonna be late to the shoot. If somebody is inappropriate and rude to you, in the audition process, get ready for what they expect you to wear in the shoot. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. like, um, I that's I appreciate it. Now you've told your secret, of course. So now <laughs> I've told well, all my secrets. The first thing, right? And then I can the really low price oh. of fourteen ninety five. You can have all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is worth it. It was uh, I, this is I've read. You know, I read the first edition when it first came out, and I read the second edition. And you know, it has the part about teaching at the University of New Orleans, which get points for that because I helped you do that um yes yes you did and um gee I feel like uh tell me about one of my favorite parts of the book could you talk about the one that got away are you talking about castaway <laughs> <laughs> it's this yeah is it the section at the end of the book or um I'm trying to get to there's so many really touching parts of your book I really loved the part about I'll tell you what I'll ask you one that's a little less emotional what are hyacinths for the soul that is something my mother taught me about. Hyacinths for the soul are, you know, it's a self-soothing practice. It's a, it's a way to give yourself flowers, give yourself, you know, emotional support. Um, and I think it's important. I think, I think one of the most important parts of, of an actor's career is finding ways to deal with rejection and disappointment. The degree to which you will succeed in this business is almost directly proportional to your ability to take it. And, and disappointment and rejection are a constant part of our diet. Uh, you know, I, I try and remind people when I teach that um, if you're watching a movie and there's 40 people in the movie, um, probably three of them have almost all the lines in the movie and the rest of them are all small parts. And, and then when you think of how many people went in for, because of course, you know, those top three parts, that was some meeting people had, Oh, should we put Charlize Theron or should we put, you know, Emma Stone or whatever. But then the rest of those parts were probably cast. And that means that dozens, potentially hundreds and or thousands of people went in for each of those roles. There were 4,000 people that went in for the role of Hush Puppy in Beasts of the Southern Wild. 4,000 kids went in for that role. So that's 3,999 disappointed children. It's heartbreaking when you wrote that. I was like, I never thought about all that sorrow and disappointment. Yes, but that's <laughs> the job. That's the job. When people say, what's it like being an actor? I say, how do you feel about job interviews? Yeah. Yeah, because that's that's basically what it is, is, is it's a whole lot of not getting the job. And then once in the bluest of moons, you get the gig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the joke they say about Zoom, people always say, how do you like working from home? And you say, no, I actually live at the office now. You know? Well, uh, I always worked from home. So this is this is... The new thing is that you all are with me now. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I feel like the best way to wrap up your book is the way you do it, which is really with a kind of pep talk, because there isn't one particular, you know, your book is not written to the next Laura Cayouette, specifically a person of your background who has modeling experience and, you know, but is also has the soul of a writer. You know what I mean? Like there's just a lot of people and there's a lot of parts and there's a lot going on out there. And you basically want people to, it's kind of like any other aspect of show business. If you can find some, uh, some way to avoid it, you probably should. But if you can't, you know, well then get ready. You know, like your book says, make friends with failure and understand that getting the job is the job. And so that's what I, it's maybe a place where I wanted to end on a point of like discipline and optimism, which is how it is that you psychologically handle a lifestyle, which is about, um, managing rejection and scarcity for most of your time. And then, you know, as a, as a screen actor, if you work, I dare say, if you work 10 days a year on set, that could be a good year. You sure. Know? And you, and you should be able to get health insurance back in the day. Now, now yeah. things are changing, but uh, yeah, 10 days a year, that's health insurance. That's you're getting a pension. You're, you're working. Yeah. Um, so, oh my gosh, how can you possibly not know? This is my, Dad, I'm on Zoom. This is good. Dad, your book I'm on is, Zoom. Your book is really good because it says the most important person in the room is allowed to answer their phone. But you, <laughs> are the so you're the most important person in this room, so you can take a phone call. Uh, as long as it's somebody more important than you. So um, the, I think one of the things that I really lucked out on was the, and this is one of the chapters in the book is, um, or chapter Etz, is uh, the lesson of the 100 auditions. And that really gave me a brand new perspective on failure, on rejection, on disappointment, is that if, uh, when I was starting out, I auditioned for commercials literally over 100 times. And I'm not answering that. <laughs> literally over a hundred times I auditioned for commercials and didn't get them. And, and, you know, as I progressed, I got to points where, Oh, this one, I got a call back or this one, they put me on hold or this one, they put me on a veil and I kept getting closer and closer and closer, but I wasn't, I wasn't booking them. I wasn't. And I, and it got very frustrating. And then finally around like the 104th, I got the job. And after that I did over 60, national commercials they kept on coming but that first one was really rough i mean that took a few years to get all those rejections out of the way and you know sometime during the course of those years i lost faith several times about you know am i supposed to be doing this is this the right job for me um but what happened when i got the job is i realized that if i had seen it from that point of view if i had known that the 104th job, the 104th audition was gonna be the one, how different would my experience of those 103 rejections have been? Because then by 99, instead of thinking, oh my God, I'm not gonna survive this. They're never gonna hire me. I'm, this is ridiculous, I should quit. Instead of thinking those thoughts, I would have thought, 99, there's only five to go. You know, I would have had this totally different approach if I had just known which one was going to be the one. And when I realized that, I thought, you know, all this anxiety is totally optional. This is a matter of perspective. See, that's a nice way to put it. I was like, if I knew it was 104, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't, I'd screw it up somehow. <laughs> I, you have to believe the whole time. And I think that's probably it. Um, I think this might be a good time to ask if anybody has any questions. Um, it, it's a great time to, um, uh, drop them in the chat. Otherwise, um, what made you feel like now is the time to do a new edition? Do you want to talk about technology? Do you want to talk about? Well, I've added uh, three major. I redid the whole book to update it for new technology, et cetera, because, you know, things do change in our industry frequently. And so simple things like how do you sign in and all, you know, I've, those have all evolved and I've included those evolutions. But the major things that made me realize, oh, I really have to do an update is, you know, I, I, as I wrote this book, it has always been the book I was looking for when I was starting out. It was the book I kept reading books thinking, where is the book that's just going to tell me how to do this? No more vague stuff, no more, 
you know, Zen pep talk crap. I would need the real, give me step one, then step two, then step three. I need that. I need the roadmap. And I know that part of that's impossible because there are as many ways to break into this industry as there are people doing it. There are as many versions of a career as there are people having them. But there are some things that are, you know, consistent that are that are just true. And one of the things that's newly true is that we are going to be self-taping whether there is corona or not. And that is because we have now inadvertently addicted casting directors to this methodology. And and for the better in some cases, if you're in a secondary market and you want to be auditioning in LA and not getting a plane to do that, this helps you do that. Uh, people are less likely now to say you have to fly in for a first call. Um, so those are advantages that come of, of these changes. But self-taping is now just really just part of our industry. And so I feel like any book on acting has to have a chapter on self-taping or it's not current. Uh, conventions, signing conventions, when I wrote the original book, they were where careers went to die. And now they are often where things are launched. You know, if you Black Panther, things like that, they launch at Comic-Cons and, and signing conventions. So a signing convention now is a completely different event than it was 10 years ago. So I thought, well, that needs to be addressed. And then, uh, you know, three years ago, we had this Me Too movement that blew up. And um, since it affects 94% of the women in my union and some percentage of the men and some percentage of the children, it's basically affecting, you know, about three fourths of us. So I thought that would probably be useful for the book as well. All right, great. I um, feel like I want to go back. There was one question I missed at the beginning, which was about you talked about preparing for an audition and you said you have a million questions, right? And you, who do you ask those questions to? Do you ask them of the material? You yeah. You don't ask a million questions to a casting director. You, no, you, no, you should have them an answered. You get, you get some sides, you get maybe a scene or two, or maybe you get the whole script if you're lucky and you get to ask a lot of questions, but it's an inner dialectic process where you're asking yourself, who is this person? Where are they from? Why do they want this? What, what did they do before they came into the scene? Where are they going after, right? Like, and then dialing down to like, do I think they make eye contact or do they have their hands in their pockets or, you know, you, and do you, do you use the camera that you're self taping on to try out things and then you audition for yourself? I you recommend that people do. I don't, but I recommend that people do. I, I have a strange relationship with watching myself and, and a lot of us do. Um, I, I'm not a mirror person. Uh, you know, like Richard Dreyfuss, when he was, you know, when he was a, nine, I think he started acting into the mirror and he would do that daily. And that was his workout is that every day he would do monologues into the mirror and he really became a master of his face. And there are several actors who really are masters of their faces and you can see it in their work. Um, and I have given that skill up in order to have a lack of self-consciousness. I think, um, especially because I was a pretty girl when I entered the industry, I just didn't want to get too trapped by that. And so, and I, I just, I'm not a mirror looker. That's just not my thing. And so self taping in order to watch myself and learn from that, I think it's incredibly valuable. And it's something that I just don't really do a lot. I do it when I'm auditioning now, because when I self tape, I'm now learning a lot about myself as an actor and a lot about what works and what doesn't work on camera because I'm now the casting director. But, you know, I still focus only on the work and I, I really am not a facial expression actor. It's not, I'm not Jim Carrey. I'm not, you know, I'm not somebody who's doing the million faces thing. I'm, I focus more on the inner work and, and hope that it conveys. It externalizes. You would, I mean, I always say actors are kind of principally either outside in or inside out. You sound like an inside outer. Why don't I I'm end? Both, but I, but I, I'm both because I often get hired to cry. So you have to do, you have to be able to get, you got to have a lot of tricks if you're going to be crying 18 hours a day. But, um, but I do both, but I, but I am primarily an inside out. Why don't I end by asking you about uh, the wall of inspiration? What is that? 
Oh, um, it's something I haven't done in a long time, but I, I found it really helpful. I, I, when I was starting out, I put together a wall of, you know, like a collage of people who had already opened doors for me, people who had already, you know, like women who were already tall before I was tall, you know, uh, the Gina Davises and Laura Derns and um, people who were already redheaded before I was redheaded, the Shirley MacLaine's and the Lucille Balls, although she's a, an honorary redhead. Um, but, you know, I, I did that. And then I also included people who had started later in life, like um, uh, Glenn Headley or, uh, I, well, th those are mostly men, but there were a couple. Um, Ellen Barkin started a little later, meaning like 20, seven, I think, or five, I don't know. But in any case, um, you know, I did have anything I knew was going to be a stumbling block for me. I found the faces of people who are already done that, the door kicker openers, and I put them on this collage that um, was right near, <laughs> right near my mirror. So that, so that when I would be getting ready for an audition, they're right there saying, you can do it because they've already done it. Well, I think that's great. I also think we live in a very special time where, you know, the uh, one of the one of the words of our time is representation, where people like, you know, I teach at a urban working class university where a lot of the students are the type who wouldn't necessarily have seen someone who looks like them up on the screen playing the roles. And now I just think diversity is so important. I think it's kind of great for young people who are trying to start now or even new people. They don't have to be young, but they can go out there and see that there's people like them. Every time you see somebody who's, you know, uh, you know, you, you get to have Glenn Headley, you know, other people get to have Paul Giamatti or somebody else where it's like, oh, someone like me is a movie star. John That's Mahoney didn't start his career till 47 years old. Morgan Freeman didn't start. I mean, there are a lot of people who didn't start till older. There are a lot of people who are either too tall or too short. You know, there's a Danny DeVito and a, I mean, there's a, there's a something for everyone to prove it can be done whether you're the mom in Gilbert Grape or what, you know, whatever is your body type, whatever is your skin color. And that is more true now than it was before because of television. Film ought to be ashamed of itself, but television has really moved that needle forward quite a bit of that. There's really just every kind of, every kind of person there is, there's work for now. Well, I re somebody once said, every Harry Dean Stanton deserves their Paris, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, that, that everybody has the great, everybody has the opportunity to be an actor because we're all, you know, you can either be someone who's trained or I'm somebody who, backed into it by accident. And I think it's really just what you do with the gift you have. And I think your book is a tremendous guide. That's probably most of the questions I have. Raina, what do you think? Should we, uh, should I directly ask some people some questions or do you think we should sort of break up or what do you want to do? I mean, I think that if, if no one has any other questions and if you do, please type them in the chat right now. We'll hang out a couple of more minutes. But if not, I think we're, we're ready to wrap it up if you guys are. Well, I can't believe nobody has any questions. Well, you know, what I do sometimes in my Zoom classes is I tell them class is officially over and then I pretend it's the end of class and they can come <laughs> up with a question that they didn't want to ask in front of everybody else. So we could officially adjourn and if anybody wants to stick around and ask a question, so it doesn't we, look much like you're in front of the whole class, maybe we can do that too. We can absolutely do that. I will plug just here at the end. We have Laura's book at the bookstore. Um, I typed in uh, the link a few minutes ago. You can find it up there in the chat. That will take you to a little bit more information about the book. But right now, the system's in between edition one and edition two. So it says it's unavailable. That's not true. You just have to call us. You can't actually order it through the website right now. Um, and I will type in our phone number. We're open 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Central Time every day. And um, all of Laura's books are signed at the bookstore. So if you order them through us, they will be signed to copies. And, and you'll be supporting a local bookshop. Yes, which we Shop always local. appreciate. <laughs> so I will type in the our phone number one more time here to the chat. And then officially, we are adjourned. Yay. I want to say thank you. And I, I also get to do this one where you get to use the clap emoji, oh. which is what you do instead of clapping at one of these days. So there. All right. Well, if anybody wants to stick around and ask a question, then fantastic. <laughs> it was good to see some faces that I hadn't seen in a long time. And, uh, 
And in particular, I have to say, Conway, it is always a pleasure to see your face. Conway has been following me since he was 12, was it? I mean, <laughs> that's amazing to me. It's amazing to me to watch your career grow and I, I'm, I'm very happy to see your face again. So as, as a grown man. <laughs> I see that Pat has their hand raised. If you have a question, by all means, just type it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask the question. You don't have to raise your hand. What is your next project, Laura? Well, I'm actually currently working on a documentary that I'm directing. Um, it's a project that I'm working on here in New Orleans that I don't have a lot of information to share yet because uh, I'm in the middle of making it. So I don't have any idea when it's gonna be ready or viewable or shareable in any way, but I will of course keep it on my, I'll put it on my social media when I do. And I am on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you. And my website. So uh, yeah, I will be updating it as I continue forward. But I'm really excited to be a part of this documentary. It's my first time doing a documentary. And I'm going to mispronounce this. Soon time. It's okay. Soon to read. <laughs> yes, soon to read. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, How are you doing today? Um, what did you say? I said, how are you doing today? I'm good. I just got to California today, so a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, I know um, you are in New Orleans, but now that you're there, are you still, do you go back and do work in Los Angeles or the other markets? Like, I don't know. I don't know when in your career you had moved to New Orleans, but, you know, once you were working in that new market, are you still able to, you know, um, go back to the other ones or still have a hand in there or a foot in there, you know? I, when I first moved here, I, it was like a divorce. I basically um, was like, okay, I'm, I am gone from you. Uh, so I did not keep any representation there. I was not, I did not keep a foot open in that area. Um, how, would I work there? Sure, if they had hired me, I would have worked there, but I wasn't actively pursuing working there because back then we didn't have self-taping. So, you know, if you weren't in the room, you weren't in the room. Um, about maybe three months before the COVID, I had decided that I was ready to reintegrate uh, LA into my career. And so I did find representation in LA a few months before COVID. Um, sadly, that has been a bit derailed. Uh, but, uh, yes, I, I, I am open to it now in a way that I wasn't before. And, and partly because I had to open myself up to places like Atlanta and Florida. And, you know, I've, I've just had to open myself entirely because the industry has sort of spread all over the place. So do you think now because of self tapes that, that in the future, once traveling is not as scary, maybe, um, that that is something of an opportunity that opens up that you could work in different markets and not be in the location per se? I do. I will tell you that basically where you are is where you're going to work. I, I have worked, like I, I'm, I worked in Maryland. I did House of Cards um, and, and oddly ended up, uh, my hotel was like half a block from where I used to live. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of fun for me. But um you know, so I have worked in other locations and that's not the only one uh, since ha having moved here. But um, basically, if you're a Southeast actor, you're going to end up working mostly in the Southeast. If you're a West Coast actor, you're going to mostly work on the West Coast. If you're an East Coast actor, you're going to mostly work on the East Coast. There are regions and those regions tend to, because the casting directors tend to know their groups. You know, they tend to know who's where. So in a reality-based world, uh, yes, the, you could work anywhere, but you tend to work in your region. Thank you. You're very welcome. I see Charles Riddle as well. <laughs> so uh, a very long blast from the past base, so. <laughs> 
Uh, any more questions? It's not a bad thing, is it? What? A blast from the past. Oh no, it's a fabulous thing. I didn't, I, <laughs> we went to high school together. So uh, I haven't seen his face since high school. So <laughs> this Same is a, kind of a thrill for me. Uh, yeah, I didn't go to the reunion, so. <laughs> there. But, uh, but yes, it was, a, it was a, a fun thing to see all the faces that were there in the photos. I just didn't go. Hmm. But all right, well, do we have any more questions? Well, if not, I'm going to wish everybody a wonderful night. Oh, wait, are you trying to talk? Katie, are you trying to talk? Yes, I was going to ask a question. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Felix is trying to ask me a question at the same time. I was going to ask, um, and this is just a general question for you. Um, if you could have played any part at all in cinematic history, whether it's something in Gone with the Wind or Casablanca or anything, what part would you have loved to play? I would have loved to have been Scarlet and Gone with the Wind because it is the best role written for a woman in the history of cinema. Mm. That said, I would have hated to be the one that had to deliver that part. And I think Vivian Lee is Scarlett O'Hara. And so I would never want to think, I wouldn't think for one minute I could do better than she did. She did it to death. But I, I, that is the role that I most covet. And, and it is one of the reasons that, um, that I was very grateful to Quentin for creating a Southern Belle role for me to play, although it was a very different type of role. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and part of that is because we're, we're, we're gossiping now, but um, I, had, I had actually had a much bigger part in Kill Bill originally. And um, when I first, I, I, had, I had four parts in Kill Bill. And the first part was this very big part. And when I lost that very big part, I was, it, they repl Quentin replaced that part with a smaller part in the same scene. And the, that part didn't, norm didn't have a name at first. And he said, I'm going to name her Scarlet for you. <laughs> and so, yes, I have been chasing Scarlet for a long time, but I don't want to catch her because I would never want to have the burden of playing one of the greatest roles ever written for a woman ever, ever, ever. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a genius part. It, it, women are hardly ever allowed to be anti-heroes. I mean, she's a terrible person. She's an awful person. And yet you're just like, go, go, get them, you know, about all the terrible things she's doing. So I envy that. I envy that she got to do, you know, a guy role. So they don't write them for like, us like that usually. That's true. Women are usually too worried about being likable. Well, and, and uh, I don't know that we are, but we certainly are portrayed that way in film. So uh, yeah, we're either villains or we're moms, you know, we're either sweethearts or we're, we're horrifying. We're, there's nothing, there's no, not usually until you get again to something like Kill Bill, which I consider the drive-in movie version of Gone with the Wind. Um, there are very few movies where the woman gets an opportunity to be, you know, like a person, like a whole person where, you know, likable, hateable, all of it. So, yeah. But I, I, there are plenty of roles that I, I think I could have done justice to that I wish I had gotten instead of the person that got them. <laughs> But, but that's not one of them. That one I think is perfect. Do we have any more questions? I have a question about the book in the intro where, um, um, sorry, Richard Dreyfuss, he talked, he said something about booking it. Like he doesn't like, I like that confused me just cause I'm not, is it like, he said it was like a modeling term. And so what does it was, he say it instead? Was. It He's so, been at this for since the 70s. And, and when he started out, booking was a term used by modeling agents. And, uh, you know, actors got the job and landed okay. the gig and things like that. But they never booked the part. 
Okay. Uh, booking was a thing that only models did. And so it's a pet peeve for him because he's 157 years old now. No, I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> no, at the but time people you do said say, that, like you book a job now, like now you, do you say like, oh, I booked this role. I always said right. it. That's what was so irritating to him. I met him when he was like 45. So he wasn't old at all when I, we had this argument, but <laughs> yes, he, he's he, older than books. He, he said that that's not a real term. And I was like, dude, that's what we all say. And okay. part of it was because I worked a lot in commercials and in commercials was where that first bled over from okay. the modeling world into the acting world, because so many commercials are booked by modeling agencies. So, um, yeah, so that's where the bleed over first happened. And I think it was a peeve for him because I came from modeling. And I think he thought it was like a tell that was going to show me off as a model. And, and he just thought he just, it was fingernails on a chalkboard for him. I actually, though, the thing say? that, the thing that confused me the most about his intro when I first received it eight years ago was how much time he spent talking about beautiful girls. And at the time I didn't realize that he was really the only person in my book who wrote anything about me too. And I now realized in retrospect that he was trying to warn me and everyone, you know, that this is an incredibly dangerous business for women and particularly women who are, you know, the pretty girl type that this is that it, as he says in the intro, chews them up and eats them alive. You know, it's just a, it's brutal. And he, he had all that in there and I found it confusing. It was like, what is he talking about? All this pretty girl stuff. And I now realize I had to write a whole chapter about it because he was right and he was way ahead of his time. And he, he understood something that I had not understood yet. So I give him a lot of credit for opening my eyes to <laughs> that that belonged in the book. What did they used to say back then then, I guess, if you got the role or... Yeah, you, well, you, got have the you got the part. Oh, okay. You got the part. That was it. You got the part. And they would have a big, you know, let's go out drinking. I got the part. I got the part. I and I say that too. I remember back in the day before cell phones and all that. I remember one time getting a uh, page <laughs> at the movie theater uh, because I was always at the movie theater. I saw two to five movies a week back then. Um, I got paged and I went to the pay phone. We used to have pay phones. And I called my agent and said, what's up? And they said, you got the part. And I was jumping around screaming in the lobby. I got the part, I got the part. And total strangers were walking by going, congratulations. And you know, cause they all understood what that moment was. Um, but yeah, that that is all Richard approved. <laughs> He can't be the only one that gets an opinion on what we get to call things. <laughs> you mentioned the Me Too movement and his intro to the book. I was wondering, since you updated the book, did you cover that in the new I did. I, There's edition? a whole chapter, a whole chapter that talks about what to do if you witness something, what to do if somebody comes to you and, and needs help, what to do if something happens to you how to figure out if something's happened to you that's worth mentioning or worth addressing or dealing with. And most importantly, and I really wish I had had this information 30 years ago, it tells you what to do to avert the whole thing altogether, to just stop it in its tracks, especially if it's happening in a public place. And, and I'm sure it will come as a surprise to some of the men, but it happens in a public place a lot. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of tools that I really wish I had had all along, um, not just for myself, but to share. I mean, there's so many people that have come to me along the way that needed that wisdom and I was not wise. And so I, I, you know, I learned a lot after the, after the explosion of information that came out three years ago, I spent a lot of time studying and a lot of time learning from organizations that are uh, built to deal with these sorts of issues. And also in, in my own, you know, in our union, uh, they have spent a truckload of money to explore this issue. And so I, I have a lot of resources now that I used for the book and it's a, it's a lengthy chapter on, you know, averting and handling and dealing with, um, 
any of those issues that show up on set, whether they be assault, discrimination, rape, whatever, whatever is your story. Mm. And then after, at, at the end of that chapter, I have how, you know, what to do afterward, if something does happen to you, how to handle that afterward. Um, so all those things are things that I wish I had had that information all along, especially when somebody comes to you or if you see something. I mean, it's that old, if you see something, say something, but you don't want to be the one that gets fired. So how do you, how do you do that? And so all those things I address in the book. And I think it's important. I think we all should talk about it a lot more. I'm still new to talking about it. All right. And on yeah. that happy note, <laughs> right? I actually do think it's a happy note. I think it's wonderful that we are progressing in that area and making a workplace that's safe for all workers. Absolutely. I definitely agree. And I, I, when I read your book, I very much appreciated the practical aspects of how to deal with it and what to do. Well, I knew when I, when I decided to write that chapter, I knew I was going to use the same approach I use for every single chapter in the book, which is that it has to be practical information that's usable information. Oh my gosh. Uh, practical usable information, you know, that, that you could, what do you do first? Then what do you do next? Then what do you, because the vagueness I think is what, first of all, it's what made me sick of reading books that weren't helping me, but it, it's also, I think, the thing that holds us back as a society is this vagueness that we pass for, you know, back and forth between each other instead of just saying things. So I just wanted to say, here's how you become an actor. Here's how you maintain being an actor. Here's how you deal with being an actor. And this is one part of it. Well, Laura, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this event. And Henry, thank you for being here with me and with Laura and everyone who came to the event and asked questions and participated. We really appreciate it. Um, we, we are a small business. And like I said, you can give us a call and buy Laura's books, buy this book, purchase her other fiction books. We have them all, they're all signed and we will get them to you wherever you live. Wherever you are. Thank you. So if we do not have any more questions, as we're gonna call it a night, guys. It was a real pleasure, thank you so much. Laura, I can't wait to see you in person. Oh, I know, I miss all these people. This is, I mean, this is like a hug fest here, so. <laughs> I miss hugging, I miss hugging yeah. a lot. I look forward to hugging, dancing in the streets again. That's another thing I really miss. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's hard no matter where you live, but in New Orleans, what we have had to give up is a very, very long list, very long list. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing everybody out in the streets again. I look forward to seeing everybody in real life again. It will be fabulous to see all your faces. Until then, I'll be reading. <laughs> yes. A lot of us are spending a lot of time reading. Bye-bye, y'all. Great to see you. All right. Thank see you. you later. Thank you so much, Henry. Bye. Uh, Great book. Thank you. Good night, guys. You have an excellent evening. Bye. So I'm going to just check real quick and see if somebody in my family died. Four phone calls and nobody died? <laughs> That's just crazy to me. What the hell? Yeah, I know you said it, it, it is, is it past the cutoff time for your dad at yeah, night? Here's the thing. I invited him to this, sent him the link and he, and I said to mom this morning, I said, you know, he's done this thing again where, you know, we've been getting along so great. Everything's been so marvelous.